a grisly scene at an eerily desolate site. Two bodies discarded like yesterday's trash. These two young girls were dumped out like garbage next to a dumpster. One woman shot execution style, another woman savagely beaten to death. The first hit pretty much did the job, and the rest of it just seemed to be overkill. What happened? A distraught father talking to detectives, almost inconsolable. What happened? What happened? What happened? And as detectives chased every lead, grieving family members gathered at a candlelight vigil. Was the sadistic killer among them a wolf in sheep's clothing? Hundreds of clues, a massive trail of breadcrumbs to follow, caught on video. If that gentleman would have looked in the back of that car, he would have saw the two bodies. And in the flesh. The fingerprint changed everything. But the biggest bombshell was about to drop. Their damn blood is in your room. The barbaric monster was in plain sight. He showed me the picture. And all I said was, I shook the killer's hand. Brittany Cosby and Crystal Jackson were both 24 years old, living in Houston, Texas, and in love with each other. For two years, life was good for the young couple. Both were ambitious, hardworking, and raising Crystal's five-year-old daughter, Zadiah, as Crystal's parents tell our Andrea Isom. Crystal and Brittany were happy. Yes, they were. Yeah, they, they, they was two uh, peas in a pot. Peas in a pot. In a pot. <laughs> They'd been living with Brittany's 90-year-old great-grandmother, Annie Lee Cosby, her dad's grandmother, helping her with the chores, errands, and paying bills. Crystal had been raised by her parents, Reverend Ivan and Mary Jackson. Brittany had been raised by her great-grandmother. Her mom, Loranda McDonald, and dad, James Cosby, split when she was young. James was back living in the same house. Brittany and Crystal were kind of in a routine as far as taking care of Mrs. Cosby and, and going to work. and. Uh, James Cosby came back into the house and was working sporadically. Brittany and Crystal hoped to move out and get a place of their own. They first needed a car. Pulling their tax refunds, they finally bought a 2006 Kia Sorento with Brittany's great-grandmother co-signing. A few days later, they went over to Crystal's parents' house to pick up Zaniah and show off their new purchase. She wanted me to come out to see her, her new car. Me being as stubborn as I am, I wouldn't even get up out the chair because I told her not to get the vehicle in the first place. But the night that she uh, left the house, all I could do was look at her until I loved her. Then my daughter said, Dad, I love you too. Bye. As they drove off that night, little did the Jacksons know that would be the last time they'd see their daughter Crystal and her girlfriend Brittany alive. The next morning and throughout the day, Mary called Crystal several times but got no answer. And Mary, who worked at Zaniah's school, learned she hadn't been in that day either. When did you start to worry? Late on at night, my husband said, something don't feel right. That evening, Ivan and Mary went to Brittany's house looking for Crystal. Zaniah was there, Crystal was not. Night turned to day. Then, total panic set in. I called whatever hospital came to my mind, police stations that I could think of. Then I told my husband, let's just call the dreaded morgue. Mm. No signs of her there. I said, okay, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Where are you, child? I'm seeing them. I said, where, where are you at? As worry grew in the Jackson house, about an hour and a half away in Port Bolivar, an unincorporated community in Galveston County, a delivery driver stumbled upon an unbelievably horrific scene. A beer delivery driver went to throw his boxes in the dumpster. When he came back in the store, he asked the clerk if they had thrown out mannequins because there were mannequins by the dumpster. And so she went to look. That's when they realized they were actually bodies. The clerk called the cops. And when they arrived, they walked up on a truly macabre scene. The first thing that I noticed is just the emptiness of it. The hotel itself is abandoned. There's nothing around it. It's boarded up with plywood on all the windows. Just the emptiness of it resounded with me. 
The bodies were found intertwined and strewn like rag dolls. How bad was it? It was pretty gruesome sight. I mean, it really was. It didn't look like something that somebody tried to cover up. It really looked like somebody just wanted to dump them off, get them out, and get out of there. Even veteran investigators were stunned at the sheer brutality. Who could have committed such a horrendous act? One woman found face up, eyes open with a severe wound to the head. First body that we saw as we approached had a very big size gunshot wound to her head. It was very visible. The other woman was found lying on her stomach. Shockingly, a bed sheet was wrapped around her head. As cops pull it back, they see the results of a brutal beating. Her head was pretty much trashed. The first hit was enough to kill her and break her neck. It fractured her skull. It actually split her suture from one side all the way across to the other. It just seemed to be overkill. The sheet, what does that mean? What does that tell us? Usually if a person commits a crime as heinous as this, they don't really want to see the face of their victim. Speculation swirled. Was it a hate crime or a crime of passion at the hands of a former lover? Investigators quickly determined the women were killed at another location and dumped in Port Bolivar. But where were they killed? And who were they? Cops were desperately trying to learn their identities. We had no idea who they were. They didn't appear to be local, so we didn't know exactly where they had come from. As investigators processed the scene, they found many items, and among them, a possible clue. A piece of mail with a name on it. Would that name lead them in the right direction or take them down a dead-end road? Coming up, can this heartbroken father help solve the crime? We're going to really need to talk to you so you can help us so we can find out who did this. Then a major discovery, a fingerprint. Who does it belong to? 